Great, okay, well, let's jump in. And see if this time I can actually get out the other side of Blight Town, which is a horrible place that no one should ever visit. It's like, gee, I guess they call it that for a reason. It is consistently one of the worst tar pits in the game, uh, in my opinion. It is... It is just a place where I get... I'm not stuck, but it just it takes a while to get through. Um, I can blitz through most areas without really thinking about it too much. Now, if I remember correctly, when we left off, there was a guy up there... Yeah, there he is. Who's gonna keep throwing blowpipe darts at me. Or I guess firing blowpipe darts. How do you... What is the correct verb for hitting someone with a blowpipe? I know that firing only became terminology after um, the advent of firearms. Before that, people would say loose to loose arrows. Um, or release to release arrows. I guess puffing blow darts at me. Blowing blow darts. Anyway, he's up there, so I need to find a way up there to get him without getting shot in the back. I'm not sure which angles he can reach. There's several more guys around here. There's also that, which I'll talk about in a minute, because it's gross. Um, but also kind of innocent, which is a shame that we're going to kill it. Um, I'll tell you what, actually, before I tackle this section, I'm going to go rest at the bonfire real quick so that I can put two points into dexterity so that I can actually use the longbow. So that way, I can ping some stuff and get it to jump off cliffs, much like something just fell off a cliff just now. I can tell because I gained souls. Um, when I am when I am playing this game a lot and I'm not performing for an audience, I can get through it usually first try or second try, maybe third try. Um, but it is it is one of the big slowdowns of a run. Right, dexterity 12, 13. I don't have enough to go to 14. Um, I've leveled up far too much. So, for my longbow, I need... Where is it? Here it is. 14 dexterity, so I do only need one more. Um, do I have enough souls in the bank? I'm saving that, I'm saving that. I should have upgraded that, actually. If I pop some of these, that should give me enough, hopefully. Maybe. Ah, yes, fantastic. Plenty. So, ah, let's just put dexterity to 14, which is enough to be able to wield the longbow. Although I might have to unequip some items for that to work. Hi, welcome to the me. Whoever that was that just followed. <laughs> um, if you're new to my stuff, I'm Self-Critical Automaton. I stream stuff and also I put in-depth Let's Plays on YouTube, which are great and you should go check them out. Um, or find me on Twitter to find out where I do assorted other things. Okay, so um, a quarter of 50 is 12.5. So I should be all right. I should be able to go up to 13 before I start getting the slow roll in terms of weight. Do I have arrows? I'm so glad I remembered to buy these. So just having access to um, a bow, which is the only really, like, manually targetable ranged attack in the game is incredibly useful because it lets you manipulate the AI in a variety of different ways. It's not that useful as a damage dealing mechanism unless you're explicitly cheesing something by standing outside of its aggro radius and then just like wailing on it with um, you know 100 arrows until it dies which is mostly <laughs> mostly only worth doing for like really tough enemies or enemies that have um, enemies that don't respawn. Um, bye! You see what I mean? Like, the AI is, uh... uh... My preferred build at the moment is, like, dex-based parry builds. Um, that's what I ran for my... Well, that and sorcery, but... That's what I ran for my most recent personal playthrough. Um, this is a sorcery build, because sorcery is Dark Souls on easy mode. Um, on that. <laughs> on my personal save. I, um... I completed the game beating most bosses in first try. I beat Manus first try, which is the toughest boss in Dark Souls, just by blasting them with sorcery because they really can't handle the damage output. Um, and if you're decent at dodging, it's not a problem. 
been doing some parrying, but I'm a bit wary around here for uh, fairly obvious reasons. Such as... Bye. Such as the guy up there who's going to start shooting uh, darts at me a second. So I've tried a lot of different builds. My preferred build in Dark Souls games has always been either a kind of a parry dexterity build or a... Um, uh, like a sword and board knight. Uh, my very first playthrough of the game, my first successful playthrough of the game, actually used uh, was a, uh, a two-handed knight build because I got incredibly lucky and um, the very first black knight in the game dropped his black knight sword. So then that was just, well, I'm obviously going to be using this for the entire game and then I dedicated every single soul I got to unlocking the stats. Uh, no, I've only been uh, live for a few minutes. Uh, my timer says nine minutes, but I only started like four or five minutes in because, you know, good to give people time. Also, this is clearly where I left off last stream, so if I had been streaming for a while, it would be a bit embarrassing. Right, that guy's my goal. But before I go fight him, I think this is the access to a secret item. Oh god, please don't. No, it's not. The other thing is that all of this area looks identical because it's all just like battered, tattered boards. And um, that makes it really difficult to find out. I need to approach this. If I can... Where is it below? There is... There's a good shield around here somewhere, but I can't quite reach it as I am. It's on one of these buttresses. Uh, okay, that was lucky. Note to self, don't look at the chat while you're running around in one of the most precarious areas of the game, which is... So, uh, just absolutely surrounded with clever tricks like holes in the floor that you might fall down if you're not careful. Case in point. Oh, he's, oh, he's landed on some geometry. <laughs> oh no, that's actually somewhere he's supposed to be. That's fine. So, as I was saying before, one of the advantages of the bow is that you can um, essentially use it to manipulate the AI. You can get them to go places and do stuff. Um, provoking enemies so that they aggro to you like earlier than they would normally uh, in areas like Blighttown is really effective because um, the terrain is so complicated that they tend to just hurl themselves off ledges um, which as I was saying previously last stream is testament to how well the AI is coded because most AI simply cannot traverse such a terrain and will just get stuck on things immediately or um, are due to competent coding decisions, simply denied the ability to traverse that landscape in the first place and never step near the edges. Whereas these guys will come tumbling, crawling, jumping, leaping uh, across the entire landscape to come and get you. Um, am I close enough to target that with spells? Did that? Yeah, it did. Okay. So this creature, I don't think it has a name. I think it might be like the Great Polyp or something. Some horrible, disgusting term. But, um, so I've been talking previously about the way that Dark Souls sort of tells its story and that you sort of just have to piece things together. So there's observable this, observably this strange, weird, wiggly, gribbly creature, and it's... What is it doing here? Dunno. It's nothing like anything else in that area, in this area, so why is it like that? What's its deal? What's it doing here? See that guy? He aggroed. Um, aggro radius is a spheres, I believe, so... It's very easy to aggro enemies that you can't see, and then they'll come around a corner and cause problems for you. Much like the uh, enormous uh, mosquito that is currently buzzing around my feet, which has aggroed from like 12 stories below me. Um, that's supposed to bother you when you're in the swamp at the bottom of this area. It's not supposed to be attacking me right now. <laughs> So, um, the story in Dark Souls is told through environmental hints and implications, strange cryptic lines from the from occasional NPCs, and um, item descriptions. And through various hints in all of these various locations, you can sort of eventually put together a few facts about the nature of the world. Um, one is that pyromancy is risky, because pyromancy is a doorway to manipulating chaos, and manipulating chaos renders you vulnerable um, in as in many fantasy settings, to becoming horribly mutated, or corrupted, or whatever. Also, these are the only normal guys in Blighttown. For given values of normal, considering that they shoot you with poison darts constantly. Um, so, you can learn these things about, like, pyromancy as a manipulation of a primal force, but 
you know, in primordial times, there's definitely a guy up here. There he is. In primordial times, the um, one of the sort of the fundamental things about like the narrative of Dark Souls is that people did some terrible sins in ancient primordial times, basically in order to prolong the nature of their universe, um, because the universe itself began to grow old and die. Um, and of the like four deities. The Witch of Isolith was the one who sort of first tried to actually do something about that, so she tried to recreate the first flame. The first flame being, um... Well, I mean, there's not really chaos control in Sonic the Hedgehog either. Incidentally, I have been meaning to stream those games at some point too, because that's almost a rite of passage for streamers to, <laughs> to go through the Sonic the Hedgehog games. Um, the 3D ones, anyway. Aha! Guy thinks he's clever. Okay, I'm gonna kill him before I loot that, just because otherwise he'll shoot me and I don't want to be poisoned. I mean, toxic. Did, did. Um, I can just about get him, I think. Or he'll just take care of himself, you know? That's fine, too. <laughs> I'll stream Shao Garden as part of streaming the, the thing itself. So, um, note that that polyp thing has died and dropped... Actually, was that was that on this corpse, or was that just in this area? Hmm, interesting. Anyway, you find right next to it this pyromancy uh, power within. So, part of what you learn and figure out is that... Um, the Witch of Isolith chose to attempt to recreate the first flame. The first flame was the birth of the universe, the separation between things. Before there is fire, you cannot uh, have a conception of the differentiation between states. So, it brings light, it brings heat, that differentiates from dark and cold. Life and death, all of these things that they talk about in the opening cutscene. Um, existence and non-existence. So, I think there's a drop down here. There's definitely a drop down somewhere in this pipe. Um, yeah, so, well, I'll just drop onto here for now, I've just realised why that's stupid. That was incredibly dangerous. <laughs> So yeah, I realised why it was stupid, and the answer is that guy is here, as is this guy. There's just a bunch of dangerous guys. Uh, so I'm gonna leave, bye. So, um, yeah. There, the power of the various gods comes from, you know, the this, this flame. It's what brought them into existence, and what allowed them to become what they are. Uh, so eventually the step flame starts fading, <laughs> starts fading, and this is part of the natural life cycle of the universe, for lack of a better term. This is taller than I remembered it being. Um, so what I'm doing right now is just baiting that guy to come up here, and then I'll fight him up here instead, or maybe just kick him off the edge. Which is a legitimate fighting style in Dark Souls. Um, so, uh, she attempted to recreate the first flame. Doing so is like a weird cosmic blasphemy against the nature of existence, and so instead what she created was the Flame of Chaos, which instantaneously corrupted her. It was the birth of demons, it's where demons as a concept come from, because demon, you know, can mean a ton of different things in, you know, whatever your fantasy setting is. Um, so you kind of have to disambiguate, you know, is demon a term for creatures that come from hell? Is it a term that refers to any kind of weird monster. Does it mean something specific? And in Dark Souls it does mean something specific. It, they are the creatures birthed from the bed of chaos, specifically. So, um, the flame of chaos is this corrupting influence, but it can be manipulated exactly the same way as the fundamental nature of flame can be. Uh, which means you've got to be real careful if you're a pyromancer. So there is a theory that that um, blobby thing which has been corrupted in much the same way as the people we will meet at the very bottom of Blight Town, who are the most corrupted mutant guys, um, have been corrupted, and that's why it is this weird blobby thing. There's a there's an idea that um, a character who's mentioned a lot later when we eventually go to New Londo, um, that it is that character, but I think that's tenuous. Like locationally, it makes sense because you know that that character left. Blight Town to go to uh, left New Londo to go to Blight Town to share healing sorceries, but um, the thing about that is that she's a sorcerer. Sorcery is a different discipline. 
the origin of sorcery is in flame sorcery, which is what was adapted into pyromancy in the first place. It's what the birth of flame sorcery is the birth of sorcery and pyromancy. However, um, sorcery as it is practiced in the modern day is a different, separate discipline. Uh, no, I don't think I will, actually. So, um, given that, and you do find her, like, equipment, the notable things that belong to her in this area, but um, you find them in a different part of Blight Town, so I think it's entirely possible that that is not, in fact, who that is. In fact, that's her stuff over there, I think, unless I can drop to the other side of this. So there's a way to get that stuff in there. There's also one item that I still haven't grabbed, which is on that buttress over there, because I couldn't figure out how to get onto it. Um, I can never remember, and to be honest, I think I'm not going to potter around trying to find my way from place to place too long, because this is streaming, not uh, Let's Play. I can't just edit out my 15 minutes of relentless searching. Um, so instead, we're just going to skip the Eagle Shield, which I wasn't going to use anyway, and move on. So we're actually approaching the bottom now, finally. See this? This is what happens if you uh, start to use Chaos Pyromancy and um, are careless with it. You see that sort of knobbly wobbly head? Yeah, that's because this used to be a guy. This used to be like an ordinary dude. It was very um, record scratch. Well, you're probably wondering how I ended up in this situation. Except I'm not. I know exactly how this happened. And the answer? The careless misuse of Pyromancy. As you can see, they're sort of like they have a sort of innate pyromancy to them. They can they can throw stuff. They can throw fire at you. Um, I think they can shoot little fireballs as well as do those odd little spits. But they also have um, a traditionally grossly dark souls ability where they can they sort of strain and stir for a little while and then they poop out some uh, magma onto the ground, <laughs> which is ah uh, ah uh, none of that. So this one we should actually be able to just um, counter snipe pretty easily. Uh, you can line it up, if you line it up perfectly, you can hit him with arrows and he can't hit you. But it's not easy. And I've just... Mm, nope. There we go. So... This is a technique that you can use in many different places in Dark Souls, where you can shoot past something, but the angles mean that it can't hit you and you can hit it. Uh, it's very similar to the design of spiral staircases in medieval castles, where uh, the curvature of the staircase was used to give defenders fighting down the stairs an advantage. Because the person fighting up can't swing their... most people are right-handed, uh, so they're trying to swing, but the pillar of the staircase is in the way. Um, so the person fighting, um, fighting one way or the other way can't. I believe there was an English king, don't quote me on which one. One of the Henrys, maybe there's like eight of the fuckers, I don't know how people keep track. Um, specifically had his castle built with, um, counter, um, with, um, the thing I just said, spiral staircases that go in the opposite direction to the majority of the time, because he himself actually was left-handed, so he would fight left-handed. <laughs> Which seems like a dumb thing to do, even if it is your own personal stronghold, because you're still going to be, um, it's still going to be detrimental to your various knights, like, it'll make the one fight you're in a bit easier, but it'll be detrimental to all of the rest of them. Oh god, I thought he killed me for a second. Hi, Mavarinthia. I actually, one of the things I really appreciate about uh, Dark Souls Remastered is that it's a lot more kind of visible. It's a lot easier to see what you're doing, especially in the dark places like Blight Town. Um, the visual problem with Blight Town at this stage is less about um, brightness and more about everything being sort of the same colour and uh, it's all this sort of weird scrabbly wood, so it's quite difficult to tell which part you're in. Do you know that is exactly what I would what I would have expected of you? <laughs> so that's Henry's what one, two, three, and five coming soon to a theater near you. Henry five that just keeps being more Henrys. 
They probably have a better tagline. <laughs> they probably had a better tagline in 1700 or whenever the fuck it was. Uh, the reason I'm not a historian is because I cannot remember names and dates properly. There's just something wrong with my brain that means that the actual... Like, the actual numbers and actual names don't stick. I remember what people did. I remember everything that was in some famous dude's life, but I don't remember his name. Um, so I can tell you lots of cool things about William Shakespeare, but I can't for the life of me tell you when he lived beyond maybe the 1600s, maybe? So this is one of the many reasons why the sorcerer is, is just just outclasses everything else. You've got the huge damage output, but you also have the fact that you can apply that damage output at such range. Um, and you can even fire indirectly because of the way that uh, soul sorcery sort of like float through the air and gloop around. You know, you can fire it in such a way that it um, arcs around a corner if you time it right. And you can much more easily than with a bow shoot downwards. See? Uh, that arced underneath where I'm standing because it followed him around in a, in a circle. Two King, two Henry is pretty good. Henry V. This time it's personal. Um, okay, so I'm going to need to become human in a second. There is a bonfire down here because this is at last, finally, the bottom of this place. Um... You may have noticed I've become poisoned. There is a fun quirk to this area. The poison applied by the uh, mud at the bottom of uh, the Great Swamp, which is where we, where we now are, which is not the same as the Great Swamp. Laurentius is from the Great Swamp, which is a geographical re region in the world, um, or was at some point in the past or the future, because time is weird in Dark Souls. Um, whereas this is just also a Great Swamp, I guess. Which is kind of this horrible sump where all of the, like, all of the runoff and all of the dross of, you know, the realm of gods down into the realm of man, down into the realm of sewer mutants, I guess. It all sort of collects and festers into this, like, horrible glob. Um, and, uh, but yeah, the fun quirk is that uh, the poison damage done by it is actually the lowest poison damage in the game. It's... For a second I thought that was Giant Dad. Sadly it is not. So we'll come become human here because we're about to get invaded by an NPC phantom, of which there are only, I think, four or five in the game. I think there's five invasions in the main game and one in a DLC. And three of those invasions are the same guy, so... Let's just uh, make ourselves human. But yeah, so um, another, a quirk of the, the way... <gasps> the glitch! It happened! Just shaving my legs at the campfire. Stick my leggy up real far. <laughs> so this is a delightful classic glitch that has been in Dark Souls 1 since its very first release. Um, where sometimes when you sit down at the campfire, it uh, glitches your leg up in such a way that it looks like you're holding your leg up with your arm delightfully. Um, I think genuinely, like, they chose not to patch it out even though they could have, could have simply because it's just delightful. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I did six years of ballet to learn how to do this. Um, yeah, so they could have removed it from the game, but they didn't just because it's just this really fun thing that doesn't do any harm. Uh, so this is where we would have landed if we had followed the bad advice to do a plunging attack off of that thing, except we would have died down here. I don't know if you use the... Um, full damage reduction um, sorcery if you can drop down here safely from above. The um, the quote of... Um, the quote? The, the, the way it works is kind of complicated because people think that spell just reduces your falling damage. It's not... it doesn't. It cancels your falling damage completely unless your falling damage would have been enough to kill you anyway, at which point you die. <laughs> so if you were going to die from the falling damage, uh, then you would die from the falling damage regardless. If you weren't going to die from the falling damage, it cancels all the damage. So it's a very useful spell for getting into certain places, but it just it doesn't let you get wherever you like. Uh, and it doesn't even let you fall from places higher than you would have been able to fall otherwise. There we go. 
This is my... Ouch. Fuck you. I always forget about these things. There's like a hundred of them and they all spawn uh, in, in this area. It's one of the few places in the game where you can just see enemies spawning in. Um, there's just... They, they pop up out of the muck over there. There's one. See? So, yeah, Manny to Mildred is my favourite summon and my favourite invader. For fairly obvious reasons, because she is an enormous, muscular, naked woman. Like, it's a confidence and style that I would love to pull off in my own life. Ostensibly, she is a member of the butchers that we fought at the start of uh, the Depths, but one who has become less degenerated, I suppose. Uh, or possibly she's just from an earlier point in history, because... <laughs> like, her whole deal is literally just that, like, the butchers, she's one of the butchers who live in um, the upper levels of the Depths, and... Um, Unlike them, she's not become as corrupted and degenerated, and she's invading other people to steal their humanity, because that's what invading does, but possibly also just to eat them. Um, it's implied that she does just eat people. There is very little information on her. She spawns in in this area, and she looks like those people. That's all we really know. Um, if, in fact, if I find the sack, here it is. Um... Bloodstained patchwork sack by the undead man-eating cook lurking in the depths. Two eye holes have been cut out. It is unexpectedly soft and comfortable to wear, but probably near meaningless in terms of defence. Bet you thought that thing was going to catch me, huh? <laughs> I should probably actually level up while I'm here. Um, so, because red phantoms uh, don't respawn once you've killed them... Um, I might as well just top up my uh, top up my supplies and level up a little bit. Now I've got enough dexterity now. That 15 is bothering me. I don't like odd numbers. Do I, I don't need any more achievement slots right now, although I'll probably get some more later. I think I'm just going to tick up my intelligence a little bit more because uh, we do love to be a an absolute glass cannon. Actually, what is my achievement? I've got... Yeah, this is fine. So, I was talking... Oh, I was talking about a quirk of the poison system. So the way that poisons work in this game, the way that status effects in general work, is that... Um, oh, you can see I'm doing about 10 more damage per hit. It's, it's like, there is noticeable effect when you, when you upgrade your stuff. Um, so the way the poison system works is it essentially... Um, poison damage fills a meter... When that meter is is completely full, you become poisoned and you gain the status effect, and then the status effect does damage over time, based on what applied the um, the ticks of like poison damage. Poison damage itself is agnostic, so like it doesn't um, the source of the damage contributes to the meter regardless, but. Um, I believe it is whatever ticks you over the top of the meter that, like, whichever source that is, that decides how much damage you take. Um, so some sources of poison damage will do more meter damage. Some will do more actual physical damage once the meter is full. Um, and it is possible for these to mix and match. But you can only be receiving um, damage from one source of poison damage at any given time. So. If you um, if your meter fills up from something that doesn't do much poison damage, and that lasts a long time, then you can use that to ignore all other poison. If I got poisoned by the um, by the mosquitoes, they would be doing a lot more damage, and the individual ticks of poison damage would be a lot more. As you can see, the health regained from my um, cursed eye ring or whatever it's called is enough to counteract poison damage entirely. <laughs> Um, so essentially letting the, the swamp itself poison you provides you with armor against um, getting poisoned from the other sources in the swamp, which is just convenient. One thing people will often do um, as they uh, play through the game before coming down here to the swamp is that they will do the... they will briefly visit the um, undead asylum, the tutorial zone, again, because there is a way to get back there, and when you go back there... There is an item you can find, which is a ring, which um, essentially allows you to freely move through um, movement-impeding effects. I think the ring itself refers to deep water, but deep water, mud, or the tar stuff that you find in Sen's Fortress 
um, it lets you move normally and freely through it without any problems. So it's a really useful ring to have, and it's one that I do kind of wish I had gone back and grabbed before I came to this zone. Um, so this is a secret. This is the entryway to two chaining, uh, two secret areas in a chain. I'm not going to deal with them right now. I'm going to come back later, but I just want to point out it's here while we're here. Uh, use a dung pie to do what? Oh, to what? To poison yourself? Uh, the poison you get from a dung pie is toxic, which is f super dangerous. It's a lot of damage um, over time and quite applied very fast. So poisoning yourself with dung pies would be a mistake. Oh, that's not the chlorinthia ring. Um, I might just grab one item here because it's extremely useful and then come back up. So it's a nasty trick, actually. Um, by this point in the game, you will have found one, maybe two illusory walls. There's only about five in the entire game. So here you think, hmm, this place seems relevant. There must be something here. So you smash a wall and you find, ah, a secret item, twin humanities in a chest. Nice. But having found that, there's no reason to think that there's another secret wall immediately behind it. So it's a nasty trick, but here we go. Uh, the Clorinthia Ring's easier to grab than it seems, I think. Uh, I didn't have any trouble last time I was grabbing it. But, yeah. So, this is uh, the Great Hollow, which is the stump of an arc tree, which are one of the two entities that existed prior to... Um, prior to the birth of the universe and the, the origin of disparity. So, before that point, there was nothing. Um... Except that's not true. There were slumbering dragons and great trees made of stone, trapped in complete stasis, unable to do anything because the concept of thing as opposed to not thing did not exist. So, um, life comes along, things come to life. And then we have. Oh, I've really messed up. <laughs> it's true, I am very good at video games. So, um, yeah. You never really see arch trees, but then you come to the here, and it's sort of, mythically speaking, you're as you go through this game, you're sort of descending through different layers of mythic reality. There's the entrance. Where's the? There he is. Okay, what's the best way to get in? Uh, I need to get onto that other branch and then drop from the other branch. So if I drop from here onto this branch, then from here I can. I should just be able to roll here, I think. I'm pretty sure this is how I did it last time. Or just do this, this is fine too. <laughs> so if you go this way, it's really easy to grab it. You don't need to jump at all, you can just drop and grab. Um, and then you can just run all the way back up. Uh, unless, uh, I guess not. Hmm. So I don't know if this is supposed to be like this. Um, ah, okay, it's clearly not. It's just oddly difficult to climb up onto that. So we should be able to get all the way back up to the top from here. Um, this this goes quite far down. So as you as you progress through the game, there's sort of a progression through myth and like primordial legend before it and all of this kind of stuff. Because you are at the end of the universe, where the beginning of the universe is kind of flowing back together. There's a very sort there's something very dark tower about it. This kind of um awkward flow back and forth between what is and isn't now and what is the past and all of these different things. So naturally, um, one of the last remaining arch trees in the world is here and Anor Lundo is built at the top of the top of this sort of giant tree stump and you sort of work your way down and here you're able to find your way into one of the roots which then reaches its way down through the soil and if you follow the inside of a hollow root all of the way you can sort of reach the substrate of the world. You find this odd primordial place called the Ash Lake and stretching out to the horizon are just hundreds of thousands of these enormous vast trees. Um, and their branches form a sort of a substrate upon which the world is laid. Like, cosmologically, it's fascinating. It's just a really cool, like, idea for the nature of the world. I'm gonna, I'm gonna zap these guys, because they can't catch me. And also, I hate them. And also, they have a high chance of dropping green titanite, which is very useful to have. Although none of them seem to be dropping anything today, which is a shame. There are some, I think there's some one guaranteed drop of some titanite from them, but um, if you want to farm green titanite to level up your lightning weapon or whatever, this is where you do it. 
Just run around shooting, uh, shooting slugs forever, or leeches rather. Oh, one moment. Important thing I'm trying to remember to do more is hydrate. <laughs> So yeah, we'll be going there a lot later. Um, mostly just as a curio. There is a there's an optional boss in the area, but he's not worth very many souls. Um, and there is one of the rarer um, covenants that you can join. Covenants being a little bit like most of them provide multiplayer options, but they're kind of like a built-in guilds system almost. They're sort of like organizations of players that do different things. Uh, most of them are PvP related, or I guess multiplayer related. So the first one you're offered is the Way of White, which is um, which you can pick up from the priest in Firelink Shrine. Uh, and being attached, being a member of the Way of White basically does one thing, which is that it makes um, positive uh, signs of other players more common. So you see more uh, text messages on the floor, and you also see more. Um, I think you're more likely to see people summon signs if you're a member of the Way of White. Uh, there's also, of course, the um, Sunlight Warriors, which is uh, Solaire's covenant that you can get from talking to him. Or from praying at a certain altar where you meet him later, rather. Um, and they... Uh, they, that, they are a way of getting... So each of these covenants has its own sort of upgrade system where instead of, you know, leveling up with souls, you, you, you donate a certain kind of item that you get by doing the associated activity of that covenant. Um, it's almost like a rep system in an MMO. So with the Sunlight Warriors, their associated activity is being summoned by other players to help them fight bosses. Ah, oh, no green titanite at all. That's a shame. I wonder if my item just- I'm just- I'm sure I'm just getting unlucky. I came through here once and I got, I think, 15 in one go. They just all dropped two. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, um, there's a few of these different covenants. Those are the ones that- those are- those are PvE ones, where you co-op with other players. There's also, um, one that's focused on stealing humanity from other players. There's one that is, um, about- invading players to defend a specific area of the game world. There's one that is about invading players who have committed a terrible sin in the narrative, which is something you can choose to do or not do. Um, but which many people don't even think to try, which we'll be talking about later. In addition to all of that, there is the, probably the least used one, which is the um, Dragon Follow- I think it's Dragon Followers or Dragon Disciples, something like that. No, Dragon Disciple is a D&D prestige class. <laughs> so, um, uh, the Dragon Followers are a group of people who are obsessed with, not with um, following the path of the undead and, um, you know, obeying Gwyn and, as has been said, uh, yeah, the Chaos Servants are able to invade other players and steal their humanity, but instead of doing it for themselves, they do it to feed to uh, a certain character who will meet actually fairly soon, all being well. Um, whereas the Dark Wraiths are the guys who, who steal humanity for themselves. So, uh, what was I saying? Right, so the Dragon... Dragon servants are... Uh, oh yeah, you can farm it off of rats. Actually, one of the best places to farm humanity... Um, rats were the original place to farm humanity. The uh, more advanced place to farm humanity is the uh, Ocean of Baby Skeletons outside Lord Nito's boss arena. Um, there's infinitely spawning baby skeletons and you can just smash them forever and they drop humanity. Uh, the third option is added in the DLC and is... Uh, Narratively, a place where there is a lot of actual humanity being around, and you can just kill those. <laughs> Jinx. <laughs> uh, what the fuck was I saying? Um, right, so... With the, the dragon followers, instead of, you know, becoming obsessed with fulfilling the, the legend of the... You know, um, the chosen undead, and ascending to become the heir of Gwyn, or whatever the fuck. 
the various lies people tell you. Spoilers, I guess, but, you know, the lies people tell you about your ultimate goal in this game and what it will do and what, <laughs> what it is. They all talk about uh, becoming the heir to Gwyn in a way that implies that, guess what, you're going to be the new chief god. You, a random dipshit. Um, but spoiler warning, that is not what happens. So, this is a surprise to many people, but there is, in fact, an array of bastards in this uh, darkness over here, so I'm going to try and provoke them one at a time. There's more of these giants. I think, they're, I think they're technically called ogres. Oh, I really don't need to be fighting you as well at the same time. That's not fair. Luckily, the throne rocks. This shield is actually apparently stable enough to, to block a throne gigantic boulder, which is surprising, to say the least. Um... These are one of those enemies where they're easy to fight, but if you make one mistake, they will kill you. Um, so yeah, the rather than any of the other... Most of the, the covenants are about worshipping different gods, but... Um, or uh, denying the gods and making your own path, in the case of the Dark Wraiths, which is really just following someone else's orders. But um, oh, there's, there's three of them around here, I'm sure there's three. What the hell are the other ones? There's one. Let's see if I can ping him so that I don't aggro the other ones. So, uh, luckily, this wall has an unusually large hitbox, which means that instead of hitting you, he will hit the wall if you are lucky. Thank you. So, I've been trying to explain this for like 10 whole goddamn minutes now. I keep getting interrupted by guys rolling boulders. You know it's not going to gather any moss, right? Although this would be the place to do it. A rolling stone gathers no moss unless you happen to do it in an enormous swamp. In which case it probably will gather some. Alright, there should only be one left. Um, I am probably just going to go for the normal ending. Um, I can't be bothered to do the assorted layers of bullshit that you have to do in order to unlock the other ending. But I will talk about... Ah, but no, you can't gather moss there. It only grows behind her behind her gate. Uh, it doesn't grow on your side of the fence, or you'd be able to gather it yourself. So if you want the moss, you have to get it from her. It's pretty pretty um pretty nice setup she has actually. Uh, she has a monopoly on moss, a mossnopoly, if you will. So, oh my god, I'm never going to finish talking about this fucking thing. So, <laughs> the the dragon followers, if you go to the Ash Lake, you can find the last remaining everlasting dragon um, of the everlasting dragons, and um, who were destroyed by Gwyn in order to sort of take supremacy from the primordial original deities, or entities that ruled the world, um, in, in favour of various mortal races, of which the gods are one, even though they aren't mortal, but... That's, there's no real con terminology for everything that's not immortal dragons um, in the game. Okay, so I think I grabbed every item in this area. Uh, we're going to come up here later on when we have finished our, our job down here. Oh, uh, okay. Alright. <laughs> You've outpedented me. That's fine. So, yeah, um... If you if you commune with that dragon, you can discover that dragons are super cool, actually. And you can... Uh, oh, I don't have the right of kindling, so I can't level up this bonfire. That's a shame. So I just came back here to refresh my spells before running off to go fight the next boss. So, um... Yeah, and uh, having become obsessed with dragons, your desire is to become more like dragons. And if you eventually reach a point where you understand dragons well enough, you can turn into a sort of a weird human mock dragon. Where well, you're not truly a dragon, but you have attained a dragon form, and you sort of... The way this is represented in-game is that there are two items you can use. I think it's two items. And um, one changes your body and one changes your head, which grant you different abilities, respectively. Uh, which is... As we all know, how being a dragon works. Yeah, it is very scaly, actually. It has that kind of, like, physical shape that um, people who are aficionados of anthropomorphized lizard art appreciate. So... See, there's just, there's like three spawn points and they just... 
I think eight to ten of them spawn um, and then they stop. <laughs> They're also quite hard to hit with your spells, which is irritating. Yeah, uh, much like a spider, actually. Um, which is why, as we all know, dragons are in fact a kind of arachnid. They just have very specialised appendages, you know? Um, like their pedipalps have become overdeveloped into big wings. And their spinnerets have relocated and become overdeveloped and hyper-specialised into fire glands, let's say. Oh, I should probably I should probably not be poisoned when I go fight the boss. That's uh, pro tip number one today, is don't be poisoned when you go to fight a boss. Very easily avoidable one, that. Um, so yeah, uh, and if you join that covenant, you can invade other people not to- Ooh, hello! So- <laughs> Oh my god, what's his name? Okay, his name is something obscene which has been cancelled by the game's auto-filter. So, uh, the NPC summon is Manny to Mildred because she's pretty chill and if you beat her in combat she will happily help you fight a giant spider deity. Um, speaking of spiders, but I- Okay, like- Look at his manly chest hair. His professional bowl cut. If ever there were a man to occupy a boss while I throw spells at it from a distance, it is he. Assuming the summoning works and he, he arrives. <gasps> oh wow, what a, co what a convenient coincidence. That is exactly... Okay, so that's the dragon stuff that I just mentioned. Oops, I did not mean to point down, I meant to bow. So he is wearing the headpiece and the body piece of the immortal dragons. <laughs> what perfect timing, what on earth, what are the chances? That's ridiculous. Oh wow. Um, so yeah, we're gonna go fight this boss now and hopefully this dragon will help us effectively. Are you ready for Dark Souls' one horny character? One of the things I really like about Dark Souls is that it's like, character designs are almost, almost entirely not like video game bro horny, but um, Quelag being a, a, a giant fire spider hot lady centaur is definitely not one of them. So I'm gonna rely on him to take aggro <laughs> for obvious reasons. Um, but we should be alright just to pelt spells at her until she's dead. She's not a particularly tough boss, even in, um, even if you're a melee build, just because, like, like, her attacks have huge AoEs, but they're, they're pretty dodgeable, um, and her melee attacks are even blockable. Uh, you still take the fire damage, but you can block the, block the melee portion of the damage pretty easily. Also, because her spells are huge and have huge hitboxes, it's very easy to get them to whiff. If you if you duck underneath and roll close to her body, she's quite likely to miss you. Um, quite apart from the fact that her animations lock her into these really long animations that have relatively small damage areas, which is another hallmark of an easy to beat boss. Oh yeah, there are there is one other there is one other horny NPC, but like the vast majority aren't horny. You know, there are lady knightesses wearing full body armor. There are women in, like, like, is Manny, hmm, is Manny to Mildred horny? Is that a horny design? Because, like, I find that, I find it very appealing, but I don't know if, like, gamer dudes do. So yeah, uh, yet another boss that is incredibly easy to beat if you happen to be a sorcerer. But yeah, Guinevere is, Guinevere is a horny design that has a legitimate law reason to be a horny design, whereas Quelag is not. <laughs> I think there's supposed to be a kind of a berserk influence to Quelag, where you've got this incredibly gross monster and then a, an incredibly shapely woman poking out of the top of it. Yeah, no, exactly. I agree. That's that's what I'm getting at. So, we've done it. We've rung the second bell of awakening. I think Silent Hill Nurse Horny is way hornier than the man to Mildred. Because she's, like, fat. She has the fattest body type available in the game. And she lives in a stinky, gross swamp. And she's muscular. She's very muscular. 
Well, I would argue that the eternally painful spider body is fairly cursed. Like, as curses go. So, looks like we have our next destination, possibly. I mean, yeah, but loads of people are into being cut into pieces. It's a surprisingly popular fetish, which is also the title of a classic episode of my Let's Play. What a coincidence. So if you come down here, there's this weird plate thing. That will be relevant later. There is a hole which leads to another zone, which will also be relevant later. I'll give you a sneak peek now, but we won't be going and doing it because there's no reason to. Uh, but also because the vast majority of the zone down here is inaccessible until later. There is a, a special thingamajig that you unlock later on. So we'll be coming down to this eye-searing place um, several hours of gameplay from now. But uh, see that gate over there? You can't go through it. There are four of those gates in the world, many of which can be reached at this point. Um, many? Uh, at least two. Why can't you go? Uh, yeah, there's three er There's three that you can find at this point in the game, but um, only, but you can't bypass any of them. You can't get past them until they become unlocked later on. So, our initial goal was escape the undead asylum that we'd been locked into unfairly. Um, as part of escaping the undead asylum... Ugh, one of these walls is an illus illusion, but I can never remember which. It must be this one. Unlike most of the illusory walls in the game, that one doesn't really have a clear hint that it's here. You kind of rely on other players leaving uh, signs to sell you. Did I... How do you... How do you... Hmm. How do you rate mess... Oh, there we go. Okay. The, I should have been... I, I should have been reading and rating messages as we go the entire time, but I keep forgetting. I, you have something on your shoulder, guy. Like, it's... I don't know if anyone's told you, but, like, you've got, like, a thing. You, you might want to get that checked out. It, it looks kind of... Like, I know I'm a stranger and this is maybe kind of rude, but I think you should probably see a doctor. <laughs> that's not that's not untrue. This guy teaches some pyromancies. Oh, dear. What have we here? Are you a new servant? Absolutely. You have no eggs. Bro, how the fuck can you tell if I have eggs or not? Got that x-ray vision on this guy. So this is Eingi. This is uh, the guardian of Porquelana here. So we actually brought an item with us from the very start of the game. We began the game with uh, the old witch's ring as our starting gift. Which is the ability... It grants you the ability to talk to Quelana, who, as you can see, is a very sickly, unwell um, sister to Quelag. That's not what I meant to do. We do need to have this bonfire uh, unlocked, though. Quelag, my dear sister. So, I think more people are horny for her than they are for, for Quelag, which I assume is because people have a thing for, like, sickly girls that you have to take care of. I know at least one friend who has a thing for sickly girls that you have to take care of. Um, so she is actually the firekeeper of this bonfire, which is why it's already lit when you come here. Which means she can reinforce our Estus flask, which is very kind of her. And if you enter her covenant... So one of the ways to get some really good firemans uh, pyromancies, firemancies? What am I? Twelve? Um, is to join her covenant. I 
I have a fun story about Priscilla, actually. So I've played this game a ton of times, um, but it is only my most recent playthrough that I actually fought the Priscilla boss. Every other time, I'm like, I kind of don't want to fight her. She's just here. It's fine. Like. Um, so, incidentally, that ring basically makes you sound like her sister, um, so if you talk to her without wearing it, she can't, like, hear you and understand you, and she's blind, so she can't see that you're not Quelag. Um... You... you speak the tongue of the fair lady? Well, do not be rash with your pride. You have yet to earn my trust. If you try anything funny with the fair lady... There will be hell to pay. Bro talking about rashes, like come on. <laughs> there is no time for idle chat. Think only of our fair lady and what she may need. Like, if anyone needs to be careful of rashes, it's this guy. So, um, he's a pyromancy trainer, which means he will upgrade your pyromancy flame and sells pyromancies. I think he only sells them once you've reached a certain level in the Covenant, but don't quote me on that. Um, so if you level up in this Covenant, he'll sell you Toxic Mist, I think, which is a very useful pyromancy because it's one of the only spells in the game that inflicts poison. Or toxin, maybe. But um, what the real benefit of joining this Covenant is that once you've um, fed 30 humanity to um, to Quelana, because... Oh, wait, is she... Quelag, like Quelana, and there's another Quay as well, there's, uh, who's another pyromancy trainer that you can meet later on. Um, does she have a- does, she, does it say her name? No, it doesn't. That's inconvenient. Um, it's implied that actually feeding her humanity reduces her pain, and that she's in eternal pain because of the various curses laid upon her. We will talk more about the curses and what they do to people and how they happened when we come back down to do the area that's accessible next to here, the Demon Ruins and Lost Isleth. But this, this door unlocks and opens up once you've fed her 30 humanity. On the other side of that door is a bug you can kill. If you kill that bug, um, something very tragic later in the game, the death of Solaire, or his madness rather, does not happen. And if you successfully do that, Solaire will then actually be available as the only summon for the final boss in the game. So, um, sometimes people will just save up their humanity as they go through the game before reaching that point in the narrative in order to just save Solaire, which is cool because people like him. But the final boss isn't tough enough really to need a summon, so um, it's mostly just a, a thing to do, <laughs> which is just it's, just, it's just our lives at this point really, isn't it? It's just a succession of things to do. So the Chloranthi ring, which I picked up earlier, is a ring which boosts stamina regeneration, which is very useful if you need to regenerate your stamina. Um, I think I saved him. I saved him on one playthrough, but I generally can't be bothered to farm up thirty humanity, so he usually tragically dies. Also, I think it's a better story. <laughs> um, I think that um, his slow loss of faith and his slow loss of his belief in his ability to actually find his own son and all of these things that he wants out of life. Um, you know, the narrative is the same up to a certain point. He starts to question his faith, and then he starts to lose his faith. Um, him succumbing to some kind of horrible affliction related to his obsession with finding his own son and what that might mean is narratively more suited to Dark Souls than him not losing his faith, eventually finding his god, and wordlessly helping you kill his god. So I actually think it's a better story if he does die. But then that's the kind of opinion I have about narratives, which is why people don't like to talk about stories with me. Because I'm like, yeah, it broke my heart when a character X died in book Y. But like, I'm glad he died because the story works better that way. Um, right, so uh, we have now Escape the Undead Asylum and been told, oh, by the way, there's a myth about how um, it's the duty of people who become cursed with undeath to go ring the Bell of Awakening, and then we started to do that, and then we found out that, by the way, there's a second Bell of Awakening, there's two of them, there's one way up and one way down, and you've got to do both. This this uh, this lift, by the way, is a fucking killer. People 
People have trouble with this lift. I have had trouble with this lift. It's difficult to ride this rift good. It's actually really easy. The trick is not to jump or roll. <laughs> Uh, jumping and rolling is what is what gets you um, falling off rather than landing on it. Okay, let me see how it is. I love the design of these, by the way. I love the like the horrible mosquito ness of them, and then the fact that they've just got these ridiculous bubbles on the end, which is just where they keep their poison. I guess it's where they keep the blood they've stolen. Um, this is probably the point at which someone tells me that actually everybody has those and it's normal. If you don't have a blood sack, what is, like, what is wrong with you? But what the fuck was I talking about? Right, so we, um, have successfully now rung both of those bells of awakening and it turns out that's not the end of the myth, that's not the end of the legend. Um, turns out your purpose isn't to ring the bells of awakening, ringing the bells of awakening is just a step on the journey. The end state of which is um, taking over for Gwyn, who apparently can't do his Gwyn stuff anymore. Um, he's been Gwindling, if you will. <laughs> oh, I just got the, the double middle finger from my partner on the other side of the room to punish me for making such a terrible pun. Or punish me, if you will. Oh, she's throwing things now. Cool, that's, that's a nice normal way to behave. See if I can get him before he gets me. Nope, he's got me. Disastrous. I cannot believe that you um, would come here to my to my channel after being familiar with years and years and years of my content and not be okay with puns. <laughs> Punitentiary is pretty good. Right, that's one. There's like four of these guys here. It's the last gasp of the of the poison dart spitters. Um, fortunately, I'm still using the spider shield, which completely blocks all poison and toxin strikes. So I should be able to deal with these guys like this and not get toxined. If I do get toxined, I have enough healing uh, to account for it all. And I also have a few blooming myrtle, blooming myrtle pos clumps, which is definitely words that exist. Is that how you spell Keela? I thought it was spelled K, like K Y L A or something. Not just like killer, like like a fucking like orc um, vehicle. Love to ride in the killer can. Um, hmm. Anyway, so, uh, yeah, at, we'll, at this point we'll start to learn more about the fact that ostensibly our purpose in this place at this time is not to um, bring two big rap ring two big bells and that that's the end of it. It is, in fact, that we are going to um, inherit Gwyn's responsibilities, let's say, and the exact details of what that might mean are going to be left ambiguous and... Uh, but you know, you can you can fill in your own own mind. Gwyn, the king of the gods, will will take his responsibilities. That sounds great. I love to be god. But yeah, so this is the final gasp of Blight Town, and uh, once we just clear through this little area, we'll be ready to leave and reascend back into the sunlight. Um, one of the delightful things about Dark Souls are these like periods of horror and difficulty followed by. Um, safety and relief because uh i might make it look easy but this is a difficult boss for many people and a difficult um area of the game for many people so there is this kind of idea that like you progress through and finally finally get out the other side and you ah, it's been torturous and it's been awful and then finally you step back into the sunlight and there's this bright shining joy as you get back outside um and that's what Dark Souls is all about, really. It's one of the many things it's all about, is this this sense of challenge and relief and, um, you know, despair and not giving into it. 
These dogs can dodge like a motherfucker. Alright, that's the last of them. <laughs> So, uh, right. In terms of more things that look like you can get into them in Dark Souls but can't, is this great? There's no way behind it. It just super looks like there should be. Did I kill these ones? I did. Didn't kill those ones, but they don't seem to have aggroed, which is fine by me. Remember, dogs are terrible and you must kill them at every opportunity. This is a fundamental law of video games. Do you know, I... I think I was I think I've talked about this every time I've played a game and a dog has shown up, but like there is a sort of a fundamental problem with dogs in video games. I think it's that they're sort of below your usual hitboxes and they move very fast. But dogs are just not very fun to fight for the most part. Um they are difficult to manage and not an entertaining challenge usually. And I think it just is that they approach from an angle you're not used to and they don't fit into the usual hitboxes that you're used to targeting, so they your attacks whiff and they dodge around behind you. But also they do seem to do a disproportionate amount of damage for, like, an animal. Like, just an organism that is attacking you, not like... It's not even wearing armour, you know? Well, usually. So we're going to scurry up here and then hope that I haven't gone the wrong way, which is not <laughs> going to be a fulfilled hope because I did go the wrong way. There are a couple more items I want to get and you get them by going over here, not by going over there. And also you have to fight yet more of these bastards. There's got to be some kind of stupid pun I can make about arthropods, but um... I got nothing. So, it's the hitboxes on, like the collision boxes for walking across here is surprisingly difficult. Um, I have fallen off it a number of times due to, let's just say, hubris. Right, uh, that was not really a problem at all. Anyway, so having dealt with all of these other various horrible things, our next task is going to be to brave Sen's fortress, which is a sort of challenge, uh, challenge area or proving ground for those who would attempt to ascend to Anor Londo to meet the gods in person. And I have a fair, fair bit to say about it that I went went on about in great deal in my uh, went on about a great deal in my old let's play. Can I climb up here? I'm sure I've missed something. I think there's one more item around here. Also, I can't shake the feeling I missed something back in Blight Town proper, which is up there. So, as I've mentioned many times while playing Dark Souls games, um, or in, well, in Dark Souls 1 in particular, it's actually a lot less common in the other Souls games. One of the other ways that this game is a sort of a remarkable standout amongst the, the Souls games. Yeah, there's nothing here. Why did I... Is there something over there? No. Hmm. Could you, excuse me, could you not? I, I, ex uh, I'm sorry, no, I'm not comfortable with this, this hug. Would you mind? <sighs> I guess this is my life now. If you too would like your fetching horrible mutant bug man corpse uh, jerkin that you can wear, you know, it's very stylish, you can wear it about the town. <laughs> um, but bear in mind that once you put it on, you can never take it off. Okay, so we're just going to render everything I say a lie immediately. I see how it is. Um, if I drop from here, that's a bad idea. Where the hell was the ladder? Was it over here? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, God, what even was I talking about before the fun, the fun shirt fiasco? Which, oh, for fuck's sake. What did I say? Hubris. It all comes down to hubris. So, um, fortunately we're not very far from uh, from the last bonfire I rested at. Slightly further away than I would have liked. Hi, what's up? You alright? Fine, let's go. Um, what the fuck was I saying? So, yeah, uh, a whole bunch of stuff about Sen's Fortress, which we will talk about when we go to Sen's Fortress. I might take care of... Um, a uh, different side area first. I'm not sure yet. Um, because there are, there are usually, on your way through Dark Souls, a couple of different avenues for progression that you can make. 
you can do the catacombs and defeat the boss of the catacombs, which is the first half of the uh, like chain of zones leading to a boss who will fight a lot later in the game, Grave Lord Nito, first of the dead. So he's um, he's going to be available after we unlock those four gates that I mentioned earlier, which won't be available for a long time. But uh, that first half is accessible, and if you fight your way through, then you get one of three masks randomly dropped, all of which are, have useful enchantments, and one of which was the key to the single greatest Dark Souls PvP uh, build of all time, Giant Dad, the legend that never dies. Um, which is, now that I think about it, a bit of a double entendre. Not a, not a lewd one, but just, you know, he's the legend that never dies because he's wearing so much fucking armor you can't kill him. Um, but also because it remained dominant for a very long time. So the boss of that area, Pinwheel, um, is this sort of three-headed necromancer agglomeration of skeletons. And um, he drops one of three masks, the mask of the mother, the father, and the child. The mother boosts your maximum hit points by a certain amount. The child boosts your uh, stamina regeneration by a good amount, which means that you can do stuff like not have to wear the chloranthi ring always. Um, and the father uh, is uh, a boost to your item carrying percentage, your your weight, weight equipment load percentage. So um, the benefit of that is obvious. And the thing about Giant Dad is that people basically did the, a careful amount of maths and figured out that you could wear one of the heaviest armor sets in the game and dual wield a two-handed sword if you like equipped specific items in a specific way, one of which was the Mask of the Father. So the fact that he's wearing the giant armor armor set and the Mask of the Father, he is Giant Dad. And it just became this like very dominant PvP thing. Um, I have 29,000 souls in my corpse, so I'm just gonna see if I have a Ring of Sacrifice to equip. Just in case. I shouldn't need it, but let's not waste 29,000 souls. Um, it's, uh, it's a sin to waste souls. Because the Ring of Sacrifice, if I die while I'm wearing it, um, it doesn't. It basically doesn't count as a death. I think the basic Ring of Sacrifice does not retain your like um, human status, so you will still turn into uh, turn into a Hollow when you die. But you don't lose any souls you're carrying, and importantly, it doesn't count as a death with regards to. Um, wait, wait, I died over there. Shit, I need to go over that way. It doesn't count as a death with regards to. <laughs> Did I land on that? Uh, your blood stain, which means that you won't leave a new blood stain, which means your old blood stain will still be where you can find it, which means that you can go pick up your old souls. Does that work? Uh, bye, guys. Are you alright? I think I just saw something fall past. I'm not sure. This is the worst possible place for this thing to have attacked me. So, hopefully, I can find my blood stain around here somewhere. It should be at the top of the ladder I fell off. Uh, or fell off trying to stand next stand on. If anyone sees a big blue thing, oh there it is, big green thing. There we go. I feel far better now. Haha! <laughs> Just got a plunging attack on a flying creature, so stick that in your pipe and smoke it. Right, let's try and do this properly. So we're very nearly back out at the uh, the surface, which is where we want to go. Oh right, that does no damage. I forgot. I forgot that I'm a wizard. We will be emerging in the Valley of Drakes, which is uh, one of the sort of like transitional locations. There's a bunch of zones in the game that you mostly only go through when you're trying to get to somewhere else. They don't really they don't really have anything. There's no, there's no bosses, really, or there's no major bosses, and there's no um, important items, particularly. There are good items, but there's nothing vital. It just exists to connect places together. And, oh, that's what I was talking about before I got completely fucking sidetracked by about 15 things. Um, which is that Dark Souls 1, notably, uh, one of the most beautiful things about it is the way it's designed, so that from every part of the game you can basically see other zones. Um, you know, as you're climbing down Blighttown, you can see the place you're going to go later, the swamp at the bottom. As you 
are running around in the Undead Parish. If you look r correctly, you can see the Undead, uh, the Lower Undead Parish that you'll be going to later, the, the Lower Undead Burg, rather. And you can see the Undead Parish above you, and if you look in the right places, you can even see all the way down here. You can see these buttresses and some parts of Blighttown. Um, all of the areas in the game are incredibly tightly in interconnected. They, they loop around one another. They are these complicated zones that feed back into one another and have sh uh, shortcuts in odd places that you wouldn't expect. Um, and passageways that emerge in places and you're like, oh, I remember this, I was here six hours ago. Um, which I think is just great. It's really, really carefully designed for this to work. So, um, yeah, you... Uh, and it fits the, the themes of the game as well, which is both the sort of interconnectedness of all of this stuff and just uh, reinforces to you the understanding that this is the end of the world. The universe is closing in on itself. Time is breaking down, space is breaking down, different places and different times are becoming the same places and the same times. Which is what's the deal with all the other players and so on, um, as they are themselves. Different instances of you in different ways that history could have gone. Um, other times the undead have tried to do what you are doing. Different kalpas, different cycles of the universe as it is endlessly reset and restarted. Oh, I have aggroed two of these guys, which is not ideal for me. I'll see if I can get them to jump off the edge, which is usually advantageous. So the thing about the Tower of the Drakes is that if you start with um, the Master Key, you can access it from the very start of the game, which lets you run down to a very good item that you can grab. Um, yeah, we should be fine. Which we will find in a moment. And um, having... Yeah, it is sort of Metroidvania e, except that um, I think that... Um, I think that genres in games mechanical genres rather than settings um, are perhaps um, they, they become overly dilute. Roguelike does not mean roguelike anymore. Roguelike means a game that has permadeath and it honestly doesn't even mean that anymore. Like um, Roguelike used to have a very specific purpose as a term and now it can mean almost anything. So like I think that um, like characteristically, taxonomically I think that, that a metroidvania has to have items and abilities that belong to you, capacities that your player, that your player character has to do various things um, in the world, things that interact with things in different ways, um, and the access to different parts of the game world are locked off by those. I think that finding, um, you know, finding keys that open new zones or bosses that like drop walls that are preventing you from getting through places. I don't think that's necessarily Metroidvania. However, I do think there is definitely this kind of um, design through line there. I definitely think this game has some Metroidvania DNA in it, This the, in the way that these places are interconnected into one another and the way that you under, your understanding of the way these places connect grows over the course of the game. Uh, so yeah, this is probably the easiest boss in the game. <laughs> This is the top half of the Undead Dragon. And uh, we're basically just going to spam soul arrows at it until it dies because it's only got one attack. Well, it's, no, it's got two attacks. It's only got one attack that can reach over here, which we should be able to hit him from outside of, which is this uh, poison vomit attack, which is an appropriate thing for a zombie dragon to have, I suppose. If you get closer, he has the ability to sort of slap around with his palms, but it's quite easy to dodge. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Um, but yeah, so... This is one of those kind of cheesy spammy bosses. There's no, there's really no reason to actually try and fight it properly. Uh, even if you're in a melee build, it's easier just to stand here, run forwards, hit it on the paw, run back again in an endless loop. Um, but yeah, he guards three useful items. Uh, the shield, the dragon crest shield with either high fire or high magic resistance, I forget exactly. Well, there are a lot of games that have procedural gen generation that aren't roguelikes, um, and are called roguelikes, and there's roguelikes that don't have procedural generation as well. Um, or at least under the modern understanding of the term. 
I feel like there are a lot of hallmarks to a sort of classic roguelike um, which define what it is and um, yeah but that's a story for another time I have actually been thinking about doing stream showcases of classic roguelikes to remind people what the genre actually is you know because I used to play a ton of NetHack I've probably played a couple hundred hours of NetHack over the years um, you know just to flex my game a cred <laughs> just a little bit uh, so actually, while we're here, why not take a quick look at over here so I can just illustrate a little bit about how these places are interconnected. So that dark patch over there, that archway into the into the wall, that leads to an elevator that goes up. At the top of the elevator uh, is a tunnel. On the other side of that tunnel is um, a, a bonfire we already found up in the Darkroot Garden on the side of that enormous like bowl-like basin on the other side. We have, um, you can't quite see it from here, but there's a giant iron doorway. I don't want to get too close because I can't be bothered to fight these things right now. But yeah, there's an enormous doorway there. There's actually a really useful item at the top of that parapet as well that you can get here. So you can't go in there until you have op uh, unlocked a thing that you get at the end of the new Londo zone, which is full of ghosts. Provided you're at a, per a certain point in the storyline, at which point a man who lives there... Um, We'll give you a key. You can murder him and take the key and unlock it now, but we're not going to because we're nice. I don't know what the Berlin interpretation of a roguelike is, and I also don't know if you're making a joke because I don't know what the Berlin interpretation is. So at this point, um, New Londo and if we kill the guy, um, the second half of New Londo are both available to us for progress. We can go through there, but we will run up against the uh, the barrier blocking off the bus. And um, here is the New Londo ruins, which we have seen before and is full of ghosts. In fact, let's let's have a quick chat with Rickett because it's been a while. Does he even... I guess I could enchant my dagger to be magic, but I want to enchant it to be blessed to make it easier to fight skeletons. Um, I should repair my stuff, actually. I keep forgetting that you actually do need to do that in this one. Goodbye, my souls. Huh, interesting. I like this guy, he's kind of chipper. He is one of those uh, NPCs who have just kind of committed to something and therefore escaped going hollow. <laughs> Unlike several NPCs, he will never go hollow and attack you. Because he doesn't give in to despair. Because he has his purpose, and his purpose is to live in a hole and enchant the weapons of the one person who comes through here occasionally. I'm astonished that such a thing exists, but I am also delighted to hear it. So, uh, yeah, we can go through New Londo and the New Londo, the flooded New Londo section as well, if we kill the guy, which we won't. Which I now realise makes it sound like I'm super planning to kill that guy, but I'm definitely not planning to kill that guy. Wink. No murders here, I don't do no murders. Anyway, so uh, the other option is the catacombs, uh, which precede Lord Nito. But again, the, the main boss of the area won't be accessible. Ah, interesting. How fascinating. Hmm. A bastard man has disappeared. And a woman in a cage has been murdered. I actually wish I'd thought to come back and talk to him again because he does say some interesting plot lines. But uh, in case you weren't on previous streams, there is a, there is a golden knight here called um, Lautrec, and he's fixated on the firekeeper who's stuck in this cage. Now he's murdered her. We've taken her leftover gear, I guess, because when you die in Dark Souls, you turn into ash sometimes. It's it's normal. It just happens to people. It's fine. Um, and because the firekeeper is gone. 
this fire is out. So, um, after the next two zones of the game, we will be able to uh, restore this, this firekeeper and bring her back to life. But uh, until then, we won't be able to use this bonfire. Let's see what the crestfallen knight has to say. Did you ring the second bell? That is incredible, I must say. But now we have a new problem. It's noisy. It snores. And its breath is lethal. This is no laughing matter, I tell you. Bro, have you been spying on me while I sleep? Damn. That stench. And I was really beginning to like it here. Oh, maybe it's time I do something about it. Oh, sinister. I'm sure that won't have any long-lasting ramifications further down the line. All right, Laurie, how are you doing? Oh, hello there. You've been a stranger these days. Why? What? What, what spectacular pyromancy? Tell me about it. I, I, I have never seen anything like it. So he's told us previously about like the Great Swamp is full of life, which is why it's connected to pyromancy, because pyromancy is connected to life, because the uh, mothers of the discipline of pyromancy were the daughters of the Witch of Isolith, the Witches of Isolith, which, uh, spoiler warning, but they took one of the four portions of the fire, they took life. Now there's some stuff I want to say about that later, which again is something I touched on in my long form Let's Play, but, um, the thing about life is that um, when it goes out of control and becomes corrupting, what do you get? You get cancery stuff, right? So um, that is why all the monsters in uh, the lower lower areas down there, the hellish places, look so freaky. It's because they are they are inspired by that sort of thing. But um, it exerts a compelling influence, and because of that connection to life, places that teem with life are powerful places to practice pyromancy, which is why pyromancers mostly come from the Great Swamp, which is where Laurentius is from. So he wants to know about this cool pyromancy that we found. It's the pyromancy that we got from talking to um, Quelag's sister. If you tell him yes, he will attempt to work his way down there because he wants to find out about this new form of pyromancy that he doesn't know about, chaos pyromancy. And if you do that, he will go hollow. If you say no, he will stay here, sitting in this encampment forever, in a sort of horrible stasis. I like him a lot, so I don't like to send him down there to die. On the other hand... On the other hand, it would make for good television. But, uh... I mean, my instinct when I first played this was to say yes, because I thought, I will do a nice thing for my friend and tell him about this cool pyromancy I found. So I'm going to say yes, because this playthrough is mostly... Thank you for sharing. I'm still an able pyromancer. I shall locate her myself, earning your death once again. So, um, on your first time playing through the game, you don't know these things. You don't know that if he goes down there, he will go hollow. So I have chosen to make that decision. I'm, he might not go until you buy all of his pyromancies, actually. There's a lot of things in the game about characters moving on once you've bought all of their spells. Pyromancy has a, well, rather primitive aspect to it. It messes poorly with advanced culture. And pyromancers are considered rather unsavory which is fine as i never got along with anybody anyway so for me turning undead didn't change a thing <laughs> he's such a nice guy and he's like it's so sad fine. be safe friend don't you dare go all over. like he's my he's the nicest character in the game and he's my favorite to talk to both with that sort of gentle yorkshire accent accent that he's got going on um and with the whole kind of he's just nice he cares about you in a way that most other characters don't care about you. When you talk to Griggs of Vinheim, he's not like, you know, stay safe, don't go hollow. Oh, hello. Well, you certainly are keeping at it. Myself, I'm fine. Let's get started straight away. Griggs is just like, oh, it's you. Well, do fuck off, won't you? When you're done, it's like... Big Hat Logan. Master Logan is a great sorcerer and my teacher. Both of us came to this land as undead. But one day, he departed, leaving only a note. I suppose he wished to keep me out of harm's way. But where does that leave me? I have dedicated myself to sorcery. But Master Logan could find no use for me. 
So yeah, everyone in Dark Souls has their tragics, Goodbye. tragic pasts, their tragedies. I guess he does say do say stay stay safe. I was just unfairly maligning you, Griggs. You don't tell me to fuck off at all. You say the same thing. You just do it with a, you do it with a Toff's accent, whereas uh, Laurentius does it with a working man's accent, and therefore I trust him more. <laughs> And I haven't killed him, I've just merely um, opened up the cosmic circumstances through which his death will occur. So, yeah, this is the thing that uh, the Crestfallen Knight mentioned. It is a fucking horrible character design. I can't stand looking at this guy. Oh, I hate to see him. I hate to see him so much. Look at his horrible lipless teeth. His meat moustaches. Just an awful man, just a terrible thing to look at. Um, and he is also the next kind of uh, quest giver, I guess, and he will be telling us things that nobody else will tell us. Ah, hello. Was it you who rang the bell of awakening? I am the primordial serpent, King Seeker Frant, close friend of the great Lord Gwyn, chosen undead, who has rung the bell of awakening. I wish to elucidate your fate. Do you seek such enlightenment? Well, sure, why not? Uh, very well. Then I am pleased to share. Chosen undead, your fate is to succeed the great Lord Gwyn, so that you may link the fire, cast away the dark, and undo the curse of the undead. To this end, you must visit Anor Londo and acquire the Lord Vessel. Yeah, see, it's funny you mention him bending down and giving a little kiss on the forehead when what he will actually do is something far worse. Um, as horrible as that would be with his beak-like face. Why do you look like that? Oh, I don't like you. So, yeah, um... I am pleased to see you well. Is it something urgent? He's not an, a merchant exactly, He's the, but he is the only character in the game you can sell stuff to, which is another unique thing about this game as compared to the other Dark Souls games. Um, you can feed him items and he will reward you with souls. So I'm going to get rid of these because I don't like to invade other players. And yes, that's the noise he makes as he eats them. Young pies are worth more than I expected. Um, I don't. I never. I never remember to use these. They're a PvP item. Um, let's see. What else do we have here? Well, you can call it purring if you want. Uh, there's tons of weapons that I don't want. Like, there's no real reason to hang on to all this stuff, you know. Like, I don't. Do I need six broken straight swords? I don't believe so. Call me when you've got a broken gay sword. Uh, apologies about the audio you're currently hearing. Um, unique weapons I don't really want to sell because I'm a horrible nerd who likes to hang on to have a collection in my in my campsite box of everything. Um, even even the garbage things. Uh, I'm just going to put the rest of this away at some point. Ditto with the armor. And the rings. I want to keep all of these as well. Those who seek the realm of lords must brave Sen's fortress. Deadly house of rats. Many have gone before you, but none have returned. Fate has chosen you. But proceed with caution. So, he's one of the only people who just straight up tells you what you're doing and, and why you're doing it. Although, he may not be telling you the whole truth and letting you make your own conclusions and leading you to the wrong conclusions. Oh, he's got nothing else to say. Okay. Farewell, chosen undead. So, uh, yeah, as I was saying previously, we have a couple different avenues of uh, progress at this point. We could go through the catacombs to get that useful mask, which will come in handy, or we could uh, go through New Londo, or we could uh, take care of a bunch of stuff in Dark Root, or we could actually progress with the actual critical path of the game. I'm going to, I think, probably go to the catacombs, because uh, the mask is useful, but there's also plot stuff that we can progress with in that area by... Um, actually, 
I tell a lie, we'd have to go through the Tomb of Giants as well to get that stuff to happen, which I don't want to do because I don't care about it. So instead, let's just straight up go. Let's go to uh, Sen's Fortress, which is another one of the breaking points of this game. Sen's Fortress is uh, a lot like Blight Town, a lot like um, Capra Demon. It, it is one of the bits of the game that, that breaks people, that actually makes you reach the point of despair where you stop playing and you give up and you just you can't get any further. You just cannot do it. Because, as I've said previously, this game is all about perseverance. And let's have a quick look here, because I started talking about this previously and then forgot about it, but um, this, this standing figure is interesting and important and repeated a few places in the game. However, these freezes are not, because this is the only place in the game where we see evidence of like actual human worship of the gods as separate from the gods, rather than the gods hanging around um, as like guys that you could conceivably meet. So this is the only the only part piece of like human divine architecture that exists. This is this is where people worship their gods separate from their gods, just like in real life, and the decorations fit that. We have we have this deity who's being revered. We have these friezes that represent all of the all of the nature of the world, man, beast, and crops, all all offering up in supplication to the this deity. Uh, which is also. She has anime feet? What does that mean? Oh, that she's got like the knock kneed thing where they're slightly pointing inwards, like. <laughs> um, understandable thing to hate, I guess, but it's just, it's such a normal thing. I'm just so used to it. Like, I stand like that when I'm trying to be cute, but it doesn't work because I'm really fat. I've been a while since I had the opportunity to do that. It's still satisfying. That reminds me of the story I was going to tell earlier about the first time I ever fought Priscilla. Priscilla. Um, so, in the first DLC to the game, the boss of it is called Crossbreed Priscilla, and she is a giant dragon lady with a tail um, and uh, bare feet. And so, I've always gone through that area and not fought her because, like, she's a non-hostile boss. You have to provoke her on purpose. And... Um, so I never actually fought her because I don't like to attack NPCs in a game that aren't attacking me. But this time I was like, fuck it, I've never fought her before, I'm killing all the bosses easily, I might as well fight her too, so I started the fight. Immediately before starting the fight, I noticed that spread out on the floor were various phrases involving feet. There was just a lot of feet, 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 try feet. And I was like, oh, okay, I see how it is. I know what gamer dudes are like. I know what this is. This is Send Foot Picks, the Dark Souls version. This is this 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 attractive female character has bare feet. Therefore, let's be weird about it in a public medium. But no, <laughs> but no. When I started the boss fight, I discovered that she instantaneously goes completely invisible, and the only way to track her movements as a boss through the area is to watch her footprints in the snow. Oh wow, that's really rare. I it's very rare that you successfully use every single one of your souls to level up and just have just zero left. That's pretty cool. So I could check in with Andre, maybe level some stuff up, but first I will have to pop a bit of souls. I mean, I guess it is both, but it's not quite the same as the vast numbers of amazing chest ahead that you get in Anor Londo. No weapons for ascension, reinforce. I can't reinforce it because I don't have shards. I might just buy a ton of shards at this point. I also might... Uh, is it worth... Is it worth putting... No, I'd have to put like six points into faith to use this at this point. I, I'd, I'd rather just level up my dagger into a blessed dagger, I think. Um, oh yeah, yeah, I know. There's there's some other ones as well. I always liked um, I always liked try finger comma but hole. But that's uh, more of a Dark Souls three one than this one. So if I just I'm just gonna purchase some shards because they're not that expensive and I don't need nine thousand souls right now. I've just realised I should have bought something else as well. Does he sell the box? Where's the, do I have the box? I don't even remember. It's fine, I don't need these things. I'm just gonna level up my dagger, which I'm apparently insisting on using until I find a better dagger. 
even though it kind of sucks ass. Alright, I can currently upgrade to raw, which I don't want to do. The upgrade paths for weapons in the game are mostly useful and sensible. There's the like ordinary path that levels it up just increasing the stats and scaling and stuff, which is this one. Raw removes all scaling but increases the base damage, and it's basically a trap. Um because the the ability to have scaling in your weapons is a much bigger boost to your damage than just increasing the raw base damage. Um, and Divine, which adds magic damage that scales with faith and the ability to permanently kill skeletons in the catacombs. Sp only the catacombs. <laughs> doesn't do doesn't, doesn't have that benefit anywhere else because um, everything dies anyway everywhere else. So I'm going to do this for now. Um, and continue leveling it up. And then I'll probably give it lightning scaling when we get to Anor Londo. Um, which I should be able to do at that point. I'll need another large shard first, but... Get yourself killed. Neither of us want to see you go hollow. That shouldn't be too much of a problem. So I should be able to do a bit more damage with my backstabs and parries now, and... Um, I like to progress through the game as a human, but I'm probably going to die a few times on the way through Sen's Fortress, so I'm not going to bother wasting what humanity I have right now. Um, hopefully in some of the less fraught areas of the game... Actually, you know what? Fuck it. Let's be human. Shit, let's be Santa. As my favourite quote ever goes. So one of the advantages to going to... Um, going through the uh, catacombs at this point is that we would be able to get the Rite of Kindling because the other thing that the boss pinwheel drops is the Rite of Kindling which allows you to boost bonfires up past um, level 2. Currently we can only advance them from level 1 to level 2 and um, yeah, if you want to advance it further you need to um, get the Rite of Kindling. So these are some of my favourite enemies in the game. These are these are the serpent men. And they might just kill me because I was expecting them to take a slightly different path. <laughs> um they're a bit of a pain to fight at this stage. These two in the in the entrance usually I just deal with and it's fine. Um but there's a trap on the floor that I failed to trigger, so I did not in fact manage to uh get them all fucked up like I wanted. I mostly won't be using uh, Great Soul Arrow, or Heavy Soul Arrow rather, uh, for this area because it takes so long to cast. I'll mostly be relying on parries, um, which once again these guys are like slightly giant scaled which means they're just big enough that you slam them in the crotch which is just chef's kiss. Uh, it's just one of those games where you just stab everybody in the balls, everybody constantly and forever. Um, except for skeletons, who you sort of wiggle your sword vaguely around in the in the empty air where their kidneys would be. Uh, which they find as distressing as if they actually had kidneys there, but they do not. So as I've mentioned previously, bows are more for manipulating enemies and moving them around than they are for actually directly doing much damage. So I'm gonna... I'm gonna aggro that one, and then he's gonna make a terrible mistake. Usually. Usually. Sometimes he doesn't. There we go. <laughs> oh, I'm being invaded. Interesting. Oh, fuck off. Oh, fuck you, buddy. Welp. Well, I hope you're proud of your of your incredibly skillful win that definitely happened because you outplayed me and not because you spawned in directly above me when I was fighting something else and then dropped on me. Must have been real difficult to get that one. I generally try not to be salty about uh, people killing me in PvP because it's just part of the game, but it does feel a bit unfair when they just appear in the air above you instantaneously and get, get a free drop attack that nearly kills you. Um, I have a great fondness for people who do honourable PvP in this game. It's always my joy to fight someone who invades me and um, 
we have a we have a proper duel and they you know give me a chance to uh, not be attacking an enemy. I feel like basic etiquette is wait until your opponent is not currently fighting something. Um, but occasionally you get people who, like, make sure that you know where they are and that they intentionally, like, alert you to their position and um, other various honourable things that one might or might not do. This, though, that's, that's definitely not honourable. You'll steal enema. It's an appropriate thing to do to your enemy. <laughs> oh, my puns are getting worse as I get tired. Oh, can't parry that. <laughs> every time, I always, they, they do that, every time they do that fangs attack, I try and parry it, and it's just like, no, that's not, it's not a sword. You're not allowed to parry things that aren't metal. I tell a lie, I think you can parry, like, wooden clubs and things. So, actually, I want to mention right now that um, Sen's Fortress is observably much, much older than the Undead Parish. So we came through the Undead Parish, it's, the stonework's relatively new, it's ancient stonework, but it's hundreds, not thousands of years old. Here at Sen's Fortress, we have much, much more dilapidated, much older stonework. It's even notab notably uh, a different kind of stone, it's this reddish sandstone looking. Well, it wouldn't be sandstone because sandstone wears away much faster, but um, it's this kind of, you know, notably reddish stone that has worn away. Um, unlike the sort of, like, grey-green stone that we see in the Undead Parish itself. Uh, this is going to be relevant a bit later on when we fight the boss of this area, because behind the boss is something interesting. That's what I wanted to happen, so... These guys are resilient enough that they don't die from the fall, which means that he's actually going to path all the way through this complicated area and come out up there and drop down next to me. Um, but you know what? I'd rather fight him in that situation than uh, on a narrow bridge surrounded by Edgar Allan Poe hanging pendulum blades. So this is another one of these little manipulations you can do just to make the life a bit easier for yourself. So if you stand here, that sorceress can't, um, that serpent sorcerer can't hit you. But you can hit him. Or her. People refer to these as female, but I'm not sure why. I'm not particularly good at sexing reptiles, as they call it. But, um, I do know that it's difficult to tell by looking. I mean, you know, you'd think you'd just be able to ask. Like, it's polite to just ask, right? But um, when you're trying to fight them with bows and arrows, it's not quite the same option. So that one does fall enough, uh, fall far enough to die. Um, but it's just a lot easier to deal with by, by sniping it like that so that it falls off. And once again, it's not really about the damage that you do to it, it's about moving it around. The impact force from the arrows eventually knock it off the back of this ledge. Um, as you can see, a lot of people have died here. People get knocked off that bridge over there, people get knocked off this bridge. These several bloodstains on top of each other here are because of this trap right in front of us. People walk in here having not, like, learned that this is Dark Souls and you therefore have to be careful always. Um, in fact, this is one of the key places to learn the fundamental rule of Dark Souls, which is when you are exploring a new area, turn corners with a shield up. Like, always be careful where you're going. This guy's fun. He's just having a little nap. He's having a snooze, or a snake snooze, if you will. Probably an unpleasant way to wake up, really. Um, with a wizard blasting you with the physical expression of their, of their inner spirit. Oh, that's the unblockable one. It's not unblockable, it's just unparryable. Oh my god, I'm dying. It's fine, it's all good. It's not, it's terrible. <gasps> what? Okay. I thought I had my shield up, so I didn't think he would hit me there. So, yeah, as I have said before, Dark Souls is... It's a difficult game, but it's not an unfair game. It is uh, fundamentally a... Um, what's the word I like to use? Uh, an unmerciful game. It has, no, it has no leniency in it. If you make a mistake, it will kill you. There was a much better way that I've put that in the past, but I can't remember what the word I like to use for that kind of state is. And uh, we are approaching the uh, usual 
planned end time for a stream. So since I've um, died attempting to get through this fortress, I think I will call it here today. So uh, join me next time, which will be on Friday, two days from now, because my regular schedule is now Monday, Wednesday, Wednesday Friday at 7 p.m. UK time. I haven't programmed that into my Twitch channel yet, but that's what it is. That's what it will continue to be for the foreseeable future, probably, unless something terrible happens again. So um, if you're new and you haven't been to my streams before or whatever, check out my YouTube channel. I do in-depth, uh, carefully planned analytical let's plays where I critique games as I'm live as I'm playing them. Uh, go check on Twitter if you want to see announcements for streams and things like that. And uh, other than that, thank you so much for watching. That is all from me for today. Goodbye. Oh, also huge thank you to my Patreons. And if you want to support me on Patreon, you may do so. I give you permission. <laughs>